Today we'll talk about trees, again, but this time using a class. Recall that a tree is a root value and a sequence of branches. That's the recursive description. There's the root value, there's a branch, and each branch is a tree, making it recursive. A tree with zero branches is called a leaf. We also often talk about trees in a way that's different from their implementation, using a relative description. Each location in a tree is called a node. There are all the different locations, and each node has a value. So here's node values 2, 1, and 1. When we start describing the different positions in a tree, we often use familial or relative relationships, such as saying that one node is the parent, 3, of another, 2. And we'd also say that 2 is a child of 3. The last typical way in which trees are described is what's called A final piece of terminology related to trees is what's called a path, which traces out a sequence of nodes from the root to a leaf, such as this path from 3 through 2 through 1 through 0. A tree can have many paths, and each path is a sequence of nodes, also described as a sequence of the values of those nodes. But it's the recursive description that defines our implementation. So now we'll define a tree class. A tree has a root value and a list of branches. So we just define an init method that takes a root and some branches, which by default are empty, meaning that we can create a leaf just by passing in a root value. We store the root as an attribute. We check that all of the branches are in fact instances of the tree class. And then we set an attribute called branches to a copy of those branches. where the list function is doing the copying. Where the list function is doing the copying. Let's compare this to our data abstraction implementation from some lectures ago. Originally, we had defined a tree as a function that takes in a root and some branches, very similar to the init method. The check to make sure that each branch is a tree looks similar as well, except that recall we had to define the isTree function recursively last time. I haven't placed the implementation on the page, but it was quite substantial. Whereas here, we're relying on the object system to enforce the fact that each branch is a tree. Finally, here we had to invent some representation to combine the root and the branches into some sort of built-in value, in this case a list. But using the object system, we don't have to invent any sort of representation at all. We just pick names for our attributes, and it's up to Python to decide exactly how to represent that internally. When using data abstraction, we had to define selectors that access parts of the representation we invented. But when we use the object system, accessing attribute values is straightforward. So we don't need to define anything new. We've already said that this is called the root and this is called the branches. So we achieve the same end in both cases but it appears that we've saved some typing by using a class. If I want to define a Fibonacci tree, like the one on the last slide, I just say, here's the base case, fib n equals 0 or n equals 1, our uh, leaf 
Otherwise, I build the left subtree, the right subtree, find the value at the root by summing the roots of the left and right, and then building a new tree, which is almost identical to our old fib tree implementation, where before we called a function called tree instead of calling a class, and we access the root by calling the root function, whereas now we access the root attribute using a dot expression. So there's not much new to see here. But nonetheless, let's spend a moment trying it out. Here's our tree class. Everything we needed to define is there, but we've also added stir and repr methods so that we can see what's going on. The repr method constructs an expression that looks like a tree constructor call, whereas the string method is something else. What the string method does is prints out a multi-line version of the tree where the root value comes first and the branches are indented. So these are the uh, two child values of the root, and then the grandchildren are indented further, etc. So if I just constructed fib tree 4, the fourth Fibonacci number is 3, and the expression to create that tree looks like that which I could have typed directly, or I can just construct it programmatically using fibtree. Now if I have fibtree4, an easier way to analyze it is to print it out, which invokes the stir method. And that of course can print out much larger Fibonacci trees. Here we see the eighth Fibonacci number is 21, which is a sum of 8 and 13. Now these trees get quite large. If I set t equals to fib tree 25, that gets constructed fairly quickly, but not instantaneously. And if I try to go with 27, then we notice it's taking quite a bit of time in order to construct the tree at all. Now we can fix this problem through memoization. Here's our old friend the memo function, which just returns whatever value was returned before for an argument if we see that argument a second time. So here I will memoize fibtree. Stop the interpreter. It did finish fibtree27, by the way, while I was talking. Notice how long it's taking to stop the interpreter at all. That's because it built this huge tree. Well, I can build the same huge tree instantaneously once it's memoized. Printing out a huge tree still takes a while because it has to construct the string representing the whole thing and then display it on the screen, which goes on and on and on and on. In particular, the length of the string that was constructed for fibtree25 was really big. 8 million characters. But constructing the fibtree itself, as long as I don't print it out, is really fast. I could even do fibtree125 and see this enormous root value, the 125th Fibonacci number, and that would be instantaneous due to memoization. We're not recomputing anything unless we try to print it out.
other forms of tree processing look very similar to when we were using data abstraction. For instance, if I want to get the leaves of a tree, I could ask, is this tree a leaf itself? In which case, the only leaf value is the root value of the tree. Otherwise, I want to get all of the leaves of all of the branches. So that would be a recursive call on each branch for b in t dot branches. Now, how do I combine that list of lists into one long list? Well, I do that with sum. So the leaves of fib tree 8 are a bunch of zeros and ones. And if I sum those up, I'll get the eighth Fibonacci number. 